within themselves, right, with each other, and also how they're interacting with their environment using the same kind of systems that we are going to be talking about today. Um, and that is something that we are going to come back to. You'll see questions about that in the problem set as well. Um, but that is something that we are going to also um, talk about later on more and more as we uh, get further into the semester. Okay, not just with plants, but with different things. Um, okay, so in the lecture that I've posted online, I've kind of gone through this last, uh, the last couple of slides that um, were left over. So I'm gonna actually go ahead and kind of start off um, by reviewing membrane proteins and then going into how it is that the membrane is kept the way it is, okay? Okay, so last week when we were talking about membranes, we were basically looking at the structure, right? We were trying to see how biological membranes are made, how are they different, right, in different conditions. Um, and we started off by looking at uh, the lipid portion, right? And uh, we learned that they are phospholipids, membranes are built with phospholipids that have a hydrophilic head and these two fatty acid chains. Um, and that hydrophilic head will contain phosphates and then many times another polar molecule bound to it to make it to give it the properties that it needs to do its work and there are many different types of molecules that can be attached to that phosphate in other cases sometimes there is no phosphate group on the fatty acid chains um, in that uh, in that lipid molecule but instead you have sugar molecules attached to the glycerol on the top creating um, the environment that you need uh, for interactions with the outside environment. Many times these glycosylated lipids, the glycolipids are found in the outer uh, side, the you know side that is facing the environment of the cell membrane. We also learned that the lipids are uh, membranes, the bilipid layer is asymmetrical. So the composition of the type of phospholipids or lipids in general, that is going to be on the top layer facing the environment versus the side that faces the cytosol is gonna be very different. Similarly, if you look at the internal membranes, the same thing happens. The luminal side of your um, membranes is gonna have a different composition of lipids than the ones that face the cytosolic side. And that is important, very important to keep the permeability intact, to keep the function of that particular membrane intact. We learned about uh, different ways that we can control the fluidity of the membrane and uh, how you know fluidity of the membrane and how permeable it is, how many molecules it's gonna allow in and out. And that was dictated uh, by the fatty acid chain lengths, right? The longer the chain, the more rigid the membrane's gonna be. And also by uh, the number of double bonds whether it is saturated or unsaturated or how saturated or unsaturated it is. Um, it is further controlled by presence of cholesterol molecules. And we talked a little bit about how in a lipid membrane, you know, a cell membrane, um, the actual uh, outside cell membrane, you have areas that are fluid and areas, small areas that are going to be concentrated with cholesterol to make it more rigid and these areas are called lipid rafts. We'll talk more about them um, later on as well. Now, in addition to the lipids, we have membrane proteins that are an integral part of the uh, biological membranes and allow them to function the way they do. The membranes can associate with the lipids in, you know, with the membrane, um, with the proteins in many different ways. So going back to that just a little bit, this is where we left off last time. You can have membrane proteins that span the entire lipid bilayer. So they will have areas of hydrophobic regions and areas of hydrophilic regions um, that are interacting with either the outside or inside of the membrane. You can have these um, you know, in various different forms where there is just a single pass membrane, multi-pass membrane, or even membranes that, uh, or proteins, and even proteins that form a pore or a transporter by having multiple 
areas uh, that span the membrane in a particular structure. You also have uh, proteins that are going to be integrated into the plasma membrane, uh, but only on one of the two layers. And these are called monolayer associated proteins. In this case, the protein can either be integrated itself through a hydrophobic region in its core, or it could be um, anchored to that uh, side of the membrane by a fatty acid chain itself. So they are bound to that fatty acid chain in that case through their amino terminal. Another way that you can have proteins linked is just as a lipid link, right? So when you have these lipid linked proteins, they can be either uh, on the cytosolic side or on the extracellular side. It doesn't have to be just in the cytosolic space. Many times when they are in the extracellular space, they are bound not just through the fatty acid chains, but also through the glycosylations that are present, the modified you know, sugars that are present either on the fatty acid chain or the protein or both. Those are modifications that happen to these macromolecules that can help in their interaction with each other. And lastly, you can have proteins that are not directly integrated into the plasma membrane, but are instead attached to a plas uh, you know, membrane-associated protein, and that's how they are important for their function. These proteins are what we would call peripheral membrane proteins. So they're not actually physically integrated into the membrane. They're not associating with membrane itself, but they are associating with the protein that is in there and thus are doing their work in that way. Now, polypeptide chains or you know, proteins, when they pass through um, the lipid membrane, they need obviously areas of hydrophobicity. Otherwise, they won't be able to integrate into that hydrophobic, highly hydrophobic area. And they do that uh, because of these R groups that are present on these amino groups that are very hydrophobic in nature. Now, if you were, I'm actually gonna go to the next slide. If you were to look at a polypeptide chain um, where the amino acids are linked together, the main amino acid chain without the R groups is actually quite polar, right? It has uh, areas that are going to have partial positive charge with the hydrogens and the and areas that are going to be partially negative charge with the nitrogens and the oxygens. So because there are areas in there that are polar already, those areas have, um, you know, ability to form hydrogen bonds with each other while excluding the hydrophobic R groups towards the outside of the amino acid chain. When they do that, they automatically make that alpha helix structure uh, since the main chain is now kind of twirling around to as they create these um, uh, you know, hydrogen bonds. Very similar to if you kind of think about the DNA, right? Uh, structure, uh, DNA double helix the same way. Those bonds, the hydrogen bonds is what's keeping that helical structure internally while the R groups are, in this case, um, uh, the hydrophobic R groups are going to be facing the outside of that chain. And they are the ones that are going to interact with the fatty acid chains on the outside. These uh, can form, obviously, single pass uh, proteins, but they can also form pores. So many times, hydrophilic pores, especially in the membrane, are found by uh, the proteins where you have multiple these alpha helix structures that are spanning around um, the protein in a way that they can create a small pore for movement of particular types of ions or molecules in there. Uh, you can also have water channels as well as um, pores that are specifically designed to move hydrophobic um, and hydrophilic molecules, depending on their structure, through the presence of beta sheets. Uh, which again are going to be created through the interactions of these amino acids, uh, hydrophobic R chains with the membrane, while the internal structure is going to be more um, hydrophilic. Okay. Now, uh, this is something that I did talk about in the lecture online, uh, but now uh, when we want to study uh, proteins or uh, the membranes that are there and their composition, we somehow need to isolate.
right from the cell before we can work with them and study them and understand them. We do that, uh, to do that, we have to first somehow solubilize this membrane, which is extremely hydrophobic in nature. So it's hard to get it to get disintegrated. So many times what we need to do is utilize detergents to purify it, to first solubilize it and then uh, take it out. When we use detergents, we essentially you know, break apart the membrane and now we can get the proteins separated from that uh, mixture and then we can look at the type of proteins that come out in that membrane region. Now, depending upon the needs of our experiment or the what it is, the question is that we are trying to answer, we can use various types of detergents. Sometimes we use detergents that are ionic in nature, like uh, SDS, uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate, which has this very strong negative charge. That's great in actually breaking apart the membrane and getting maximum amount of protein out of there. But as a result of this strong negative charge, it's going to destroy the charges associated with the proteins themselves. And it's going to cause denaturation of the actual proteins into their primary structure. If we wanted to maintain their activity and maintain the structure of the proteins that, uh, of the proteins that we want to study, we instead then uh, use a switrionic or a non-ionic detergent, kind of um, similar to Triton X which is going to be milder and will lead to not getting maximum uh, output. So we won't be able to get all the proteins out, but the proteins that we do get out will be um, more, uh, will have more integrity and we'll be able to run enzymatic assays with them to understand their activity profile. Okay. So now the last thing that we are going to talk about uh, from this chapter is how these, uh, this composition of the membrane is kept the way it needs to be to do the work. Because if you remember, uh, we've talked about how the entire biological membrane is not the same all around, right? If you were just looking at, for example, the plasma membrane, there will be areas that will be concentrated in proteins. There will be areas that are more concentrated with a particular type of receptor to do a particular type of work. Um, and that's because there is another, a final layer of control on the fluidity of that membrane that is enforced by what we call the cell cortex. In this case, there are proteins called spectrin that work as dimers. So they work together. These are these long rope-like proteins. They work in combination with actin, um, which is another structural protein. Uh, so they bind to the actin uh, protein molecules and they are uh, using actin as an anchor. Uh, there are other attachment proteins that play a part in there, but the main proteins you should look at, think of a no, is your actin um, and spectrin dimers. That these two kind of work together to create a network or a mesh around the membrane so that the proteins, um, so that the structure remains intact. It's kind of like a little cage around it to keep everything the way it is. So it still allows movement of proteins through that membrane space, but it reduces how much they can move and how far they can go. Another thing that can allow movement of proteins to be restricted is um, presence of specific types of junctions or specific types of um, attachment points between cells uh, that are adjacent to each other. So there are four different ways that we can control the composition of member uh, the membrane uh, proteins in a particular area and we can restrict the movement of these membrane proteins in the membrane itself from going too far or from going to a different area that they are not needed. One is if they are tethered to the cortex itself. Now cortex is on the inner side of the cell membrane, right? It's towards the cytosolic side where the cell's own structure, structural actin and you know, uh, myosin primers are all there too. The other way is to be tethered to the extracellular matrix, to the outside of the um, cell membrane. So in this case, again, there'll be proteins that are tethered to the extracellular matrix with the help of other proteins or with the help of glycos uh, glycosylation. So sugar molecules that are attached either to these proteins 
or to the matrix or both. They can also be tethered to each uh, to other proteins on the adjacent cells uh, through binding with them. And that can also happen with or without plaque oscillations, but that's another way they can be attached. And finally, the last way that they work is through diffusion barriers. Now, these diffusion barriers are created by uh, the presence of um, gap junctions in the cells, uh, in the cell membranes. So wherever there is kind of like this little break in the cell membrane through the gap junction, the proteins cannot pass that to the opposite side. So the composition in this case of proteins on the top side is going to be very different than the ones on the bottom. And these proteins may be very fluid and move uh, within that space very easily, very freely. They won't be able to pass this gap to the other side. Similarly, the proteins on the opposite side will have the same thing. So all these different ways are used to control the composition of the membrane um, to be the way it is and to control it and restrict it in appropriate ways. Now, if we were to, you know, originally the fluidity of the plasma membrane was seen uh, by doing these experiments where they fuse two different types of cells. One where the membrane proteins were fluorescently labeled um, with one fluorescent molecule. And, uh, you know, these are mouse cells. So you had one cell that was fluorescently labeled with a red dye, another one that was fluorescently labeled with a blue or a green dye. And then they were fused together to create a hybrid cell. Initially, when they were fused, the two cell membranes uh, were quite different. You could see the two uh, cells, the two types of um, labels very separated. However, within a short period of time, they noticed that it became more homogeneous in nature. So both um, of those uh, labels were able, you know, the proteins that were labeled uh, in the two cells were moving constantly within that cell membrane. This is from an experiment back in 1970. Um, and these observations proved that the membrane was indeed fluid and the things could move from one place to another. Proteins as, as um, you know, lipid molecules. So this shows that the move, uh, proteins are able to move laterally all over the cell membrane. Another way that they have looked at uh, actually trying to quantify the diffusion of proteins throughout the membrane is by using what we call the photo bleaching method. In this case, they label the membrane proteins uh, fluorescently, and then they bleach uh, a, a small portion of the lipid membrane. So this is actually, you know, it doesn't have to be a fluorescent label just on the membrane proteins. They've also done similar experiments where they have done uh, the same thing to the actual phospholipids as well. But in this case, we're looking specifically at protein movements. So they bleach a small area of the cell membrane by uh, basically running a laser beam to it and that light bleaches the fluorescence in there, bleaches it out. So now they're no longer labeled. And then they follow it over time to see if it can recover. And they notice that there is a very short period of time that is needed before it recovers the fluorescence um, in the entire space meaning that the proteins are able to move laterally throughout that membrane space. Okay. And this again is again talking about those tight junctions and gap junctions that are there in order to create um, those barriers to this diffusion. So that when you do have these tight junctions present, when you do have gap junctions present, the proteins are not going to be as freely movable. So in this case, if you were to bleach this portion um, it could still recover from the ones around it, but it won't be able to recover by proteins that are present down here, the protein B that is present down here, right? So those proteins are going to be different in the apical versus the lateral versus the basal membrane, and their behavior is going to be different. Uh, the membrane behavior is going to be different because of these proteins that are present there to do the transport functions. Uh, finally, our glycolipids, uh, you know, you have in um, several types of modifications that happen on our cell membranes. Cell membranes, as we talked about, the phospholipids uh, themselves can be modified. So you can have other polar groups attached to the phospholipids. 
You can have sugars attached to the phospholipids or to the lipid molecules themselves. Proteins that are present within the lipids can also be similarly glycosylated as well. And they are. And that is extremely important for their proper functioning. So at the end of the day, our cells are actually coated with sugar molecules, right? Um, carbohydrate layer, essentially, because there are proteins that are going to be part of glycosylated in the extracellular matrix. Um, there are proteins that are going to be glycosylated in the actual membrane, and they will be important for attachment points as well as for their activity and function. And those um, eukaryotic, you know, eukaryotic coatings of proteins are important in their proper function. We will also find out later on in the semester when we are working with cancer cells that they have changed the type of modifications that happen on the cell surface that can then be used by their immune system, by our own immune system to recognize them as something different when the cancer is in early stages. However, later on in the cancer, uh, you know, as the cancer progresses, they change those modifications in, the, in a way that they are no longer recognizable as even existing in that space. So they are essentially invisible to the immune system at that point. And that's one of the ways that cancer cells can survive uh, inside the body and continue to grow and divide. Um, and so this is, again, just reviewing that, that carbohydrates that are present on top of the cells are used uh, to recognize self versus non-self. That's one of the things that immune cells do is that they use these sugars, these specific uh, sugar attachments on the cell membranes to recognize if this, uh, that particular cell is supposed to be there or not. And it is also used to look for sites of infection and to take care of uh, those germs, okay? Any questions on this last uh, on chapter 11, before we go to chapter 12. Uh, I have a question. Uh, in which cells we can find that tight junction type? Which so cells? So are throughout our body. In all cells, you will have areas that will have the tight junctions. They're especially important throughout our, you know, our gut and intestinal uh, system because they have to control where they're picking up the glucose or nutrients from and where they're going to release it. Without this control, uh, without having these specific areas on the cell uh, to move the, to pick up the glucose molecule on the apical end and then release it towards the inner side, the luminal end, they won't be able to function the way that uh, we want them to. We won't be, able, you know, they would pick up the glucose and then not release it to the body or they would release everything to the body and not be able to pick up more. So it is very important in just general functioning, everyday functions that we perform throughout our body. So that's the biggest example. And we're going to actually talk about this exact example uh, in chapter 12, but also nerve cells will also have similar, similar type of areas, muscle cells as well, to control the way we are contracting and relaxing a particular area of our body. Okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And about the, uh, the sugar on the top of the main brain, is it like the same, is it like the same thing as the, that major histocompatibility complex? Is it those kind of antibodies? Well, those are part of it. That's also part of the recognition system, right? So that's one way that we recognize those, yes, or create those. Okay, thank you. Yes, that is uh, one aspect. Not the only one, but that is one aspect. Any others? <laughs> okay, well, let's go to our next chapter. Any plant lovers here? I do like gardening and I do like to play with plants, although I can't keep some type of plants alive. According to the book, maybe I touch them too much. Who knows? Some I can do very well with. Others, oh, I kill. We killed every single plant. <laughs> 
my kids water it. Three of them wants to water it, so. <laughs> Yes. Well, my two-year-old, anytime that I'm weeding, he'll come out and he'll start pulling out the actual plants, not the weeds. <laughs> so That's it doesn't fun. work very well with him either. I can't have plants because my cats like to knock them over. Oh, and I yeah. had a cactus with like my childhood cat and she killed him while we were out of town. And like, I just oh, found no. them on the ground and everything just spread around and I would, it was devastating. That is terrible. Oh my goodness. I have succulents and they're extremely hard to kill unless you like overwater them every single day. Like you're only supposed to yeah. water them once a week. Yeah, so um, I have killed succulents, so I know because oh no. Yeah, no, I'm better able to keep them now, but the first time I had succulents, I remember oh, they were so pretty and I killed them all, but now I'm better with them. But I do have, you know, nowadays my garden looks a little wild. I've been very busy, um, but uh, so I haven't taken care of them quite as much as I used to. But uh, I usually enjoy gardening and it is one way to relax. But yes. Cool. Well, maybe we'll learn to take care of our plants better after we read a few chapters, right? That's my goal. Okay, so today we are going to talk about how all this stuff that we make up the biological membranes um, can be used to transport things across the cell membranes. Not just, you know, we are going to focus a lot on the outer membrane, but we are also going to talk about how that changes inside as well. So we are going to start off by talking about the main principles behind how transmembrane transport happens. We are going to talk about different type of transporters and their function. And then we are going to talk about two different types of um, movement uh, in our body. One with membrane potential uh, using the ion channels. And then finally ion channels and how nerve cell signaling happens. So both of those uh, will be what we will focus on towards the end. Um, and that nerve signaling is probably where uh, we may be running out of time, probably, hopefully not. Okay, so the proteins that are part of your cell membrane are essential for proper movement of solutes across the plasma membrane. Because if you just had a liposome, right? Just no protein, only an artificial lipid bilayer, you're gonna be able to have very few molecules go in and out of that cell. Majority of the stuff is going to remain where it is and it's not gonna uh, be able to transport very well, right? It's essentially impermeable to any kind of ions and anything that's um, going to be a large molecule, it's gonna be impermeable to as well. So there'll be very few molecules that will be able to go in and out. On the other hand, if you look at actual cell membranes, we know that many types of molecules can go in and out of those cells and they do that with the help of these protein transporters. One of the things that we need to be mindful of is that the ions that we are going to be talking about are extremely important in proper functioning cells. Uh, our survival is kind of dependent on proper concentrations of ionic substances being maintained inside the cell in an appropriate way. Um, and so there are certain ions that I want you to know about, right? So there are cations that are positively charged ion and uh, anions, which are the negatively charged ions, the ones that are most important for our survival are the ones that are listed here. So you should be able to name these. Uh, and those are your sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and hydrogen ions. These are the main ones that uh, we want to focus on. We will talk about them in various ways throughout the semester. And for anions, it's the chloride ions, sodium and chloride ions. Uh, all of these are extremely important for proper functioning uh, mammalian cell or any cell in general. Uh, so now let's look at our artificial lipid bilayer again, right? So we just have a lipid layer, nothing else in there, no proteins. We're going to notice that really small nonpolar molecules will go readily through this. This includes our oxygen, CO2, nitrogen, you know, some small steroid hormones those things, 
should be able to get through the membrane very easily because they are nonpolar. They can interact with the hydrophobic area and they can go through. Now, when we look at important things like you know some other important things that are small, so they could technically get through. However, they're uncharged uh, and they're uncharged. So they could again, technically get through, but they're polar molecules like water, ethanol, or glycerol, there is very little uh, transport able uh, that can happen in just a lipid membrane. It just gave me a notice that it was unstable internet. You guys can hear me fine, right? Yes. Or no? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. What can I do with you? Okay, so, um, you know, again, as we know, 60 to 80 percent of our body is water or depending on the organism, we need the water so we can't leave it out. So we need ways to transport at least water, if nothing else, inside. Now, when we look at larger uncharged polar molecules that are, again, important for our survivals that are building blocks of those macromolecules that make us who we are, amino acids, glucose for our energy production, nucleosides to make our DNA, RNA, and ATP, they are going to have even a less chance of being able to get through because of their large size. Um, and finally, none of these ions that are essential for our survival can get through. They will all be excluded completely. So obviously, if we just had a lipid bilayer, it's not going to work for us. We needed something else. And that something else is the proteins. Now, there are two main classes of transport proteins uh, that are associated with the membrane. One is what we call a transporter or carrier. In this case, uh, these proteins are going to bind to the molecule that they are trying to move. And the change in conformation through that binding will allow it to move either inside the cell or outside the cell, depending on where it is going. The second type of uh, membrane transport proteins are channels, where they are providing just the right environment for the type of molecule that they are transporting so it can pass through the membrane without interacting with the lipids outside at all. And this is what ions use many of the times. The ions are, uh, there are ion channels all along the plasma membrane that allow for the movement of ions into and out of the cell. So, so the, uh, yes, I'm sorry, the channel is specific to the molecule that it wants to move through. It doesn't like change for a molecule. No, the channel is going to be specific for a specific molecule. Yes. Okay. So you're right. That's right. Yes. So some channels can allow a category of molecules, but sometimes they're extremely specific for the type of molecules that get through. Okay. And these are not binding. These proteins in the channel are not interacting with the molecules that they are transporting. They're just flowing. They're providing a channel to go through, just a little tunnel to go through, and that's it. OK, so the multiple ways that um, trans uh, transport of solids can take place from in the membrane. One is through simple, simple diffusion, right? If there is a tiny molecule, that can interact with the lipids in there, and it can, um, it just needs to go through the membrane in accordance with the concentration gradient. It will move through simple diffusion through the lipid membrane, no problem. Uh, then there are molecules that need to be transported through uh, with the help of proteins. And those could be either channel mediated, where the proteins in the channel are not interacting with the molecule, are just providing the environment for it to go through with the concentration gradient again, right? So it's still going through with the concentration gradient. Or a transporter that is, again, in this case, I'm showing you an example where it is going with the concentration gradient, so from higher concentration to the lower concentration, whether it is going into the cell or going out of the cell. These types of transports are going to be called passive transport since they are just moving the ions or moving the proteins or solids along their uh, you know, uh, concentration gradient, it won't require active energy input. On the other hand, sometimes you are moving mole molecules or solutes across the membrane 
against the concentration gradient. In this case, you're going to require a transporter that's what we call a pump because it is going to require an energy input in order to function against the concentration gradient. And this type of transport is what we call an active transport, okay? So majority of the transport uh, types that you're gonna be looking at is simple diffusion, channel mediated, transporter mediated, going with the concentration gradient, which will be all passive transport. However, in the case of a pump, you're going to have an active transport where energy input is required to move the molecules or solutes against the concentration gradient. Um, so in this case, right, um, now let's look at an example of how this works. So when we are looking at ion, ionic transport, things that are ionic, you know, ions of some sort moving into or out of the cell, it is going to take into account both the concentration of the ion itself and the membrane potential. And together as a whole, they will uh, be able to look at the gradient of, uh, of the passive transport. So remember, I talked about ionic channels. The ionic channels can be uh, moved, uh, can work through passive transport because of this principle because it's not just looking at how many ions are present in one place or another. It is looking at both the presence of that ion, uh, you know, that specific ion that you're trying to transport and the membrane potential and taking the sum of that to move uh, the molecule or move the ion with the electrochemical gradient in this case towards that direction. So in this case, since the membrane potential is all positive on that side of the membrane, and there are a lot of positive ions, the concentration gradient is gonna move it to the inside. On the other hand, when in the, inside the cell, the membrane potential is all negative, and you have a lot of positive ions here, they will be going towards the outside, but they will not go outside at the same rate as they were coming in. Right? They will be able to come in a lot faster than they go out because the membrane potential outside is already positive. So you will have a slower rate of movement for, of ions out of the cell as it is inside the cell. And that is how we keep our cytosolic concentration of ions intact. The concentration of ions inside the cell is a lot higher than what it is in the environment because of this principle. Is that clear? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, remember water and we need it and it's important for our survival. So we have to look at how water molecules are going to be moving into our membranes, through our membranes into the cell as well. Well, there are specific channels that are made specifically for water. These are called aquaporins. They are uh, in plasma membranes of some cells. This is one way that water molecules can go into the cell. And actually the beta sheet um, little protein structure that we saw at the end of last chapter is something similar. It was a water channel as well. Aquaporins provide a specific environment for these water molecules to just kind of flow through. That's, you know, they can very easily move through these channels into the cell from the outside. Now we use these water channels to maintain the um, you know, osmotic pressure inside our cells to maintain our survival. Um, now there, how, uh, we have to make sure that we don't get too much of it inside or we are going to have osmotic swelling. And if it's an animal cell, it can burst and end up essentially dead, right? If it's a plant cell, however, they actually uh, use this osmotic pressure to their uh, advantage. And that's how they maintain their rigid structure and they keep their leaves out so they can perform photosynthesis. They can collect that light and go through photosynthesis. Um, so in a plant cell, you have these large central vacuoles that can absorb this water and kind of maintain the um, osmotic pressure. In addition, you have that outer cell wall that allows the cell to get to a much more target space or much more, uh, you know, higher uh, osmotic pressure without bursting. And that allows it to maintain its structural integrity. 
On the other hand, if you look at a protozoan, a small protozoan, they, um, when they have too much water inside, they can try to maintain their survival by releasing some of that through a, a contractile vacuole, where the, again, the vacuole uh, absorbs some of that water and then uh, throws it out into the extracellular space or into the environment. Animal cells, on the other hand, uh, have a different way. They maintain the osmotic pressure through movement of ions to the outside of the cell to maintain the right amount of uh, water uh, molecules inside, the right amount of type of environment inside. The other thing that they have is their cytoskeleton, right? The actin cytoskeletal structure is going to be important part of maintaining um, the cell structure intact and uh, providing it with that protection so it is less likely to burst and uh, get destroyed as well. Now, when we look at the membranes themselves, uh, the membrane on the outside, the cell membrane, is going to have very different composition of proteins and transporters than what uh, when we look at a mitochondria or a lysosome or a nucleus because each one of those membranes have very different in, uh, environment or requirement for the type of ions and the, for the type of molecules that need to go in and out of them. For example, a lysosome will have these proton pumps to take hydrogen ions in them for the work that they need to perform. While our outer membranes are the ones by far that are going to be the most versatile, right? They will need to have transporters for each one of the macromolecule components um, you know, that need to happen. They will need to have ion channels. They will need to have aquaporins for water control. So our outer membranes are going to have a lot more variety of transporters and proteins to transport things than the inner uh, membranes themselves that are going to be a little bit more specific. Now, these, by the way, are not all the different transporters, obviously, that are present inside our cells, but just an example to give. Okay, so we're gonna start talking about a few types of transporters at this point. Um, and the first one that we're going to talk about is a passive transporter that moves simply solutes again uh, along its electrochemical grade. It's not going to require any energy input into it. In this case, this transporter is uh, going to have, these transporters are very specific. So they are going to be for a specific molecule, a glucose molecule. Like the lactose molecule, that specific, right? Um, in this case, this transporter is going to move glucose from one side of the cell from the extracellular space into the cell. In a glucose transporter, uh, the glucose binding site uh, will bind the glucose molecule. When it binds the glucose molecule, that changes the conformation of that, uh, of that transporter so that it flips uh, and goes into the cell where it then releases the glucose into the cytosolic space. And then it just kind of goes between these three states. It goes to an open conformation outside the cell, binds the glucose that um, closes it and flips it, releases it to the outside of the, uh, to the inside of the cell and goes back and forth. So there are just simple conformation changes that kind of open it, close it, release it, and keep going back and forth until the concentration is the way it is needed to be. In the case of an active transport uh, with the, uh, you know, where you're taking a solute against the uh, electrochemical gradient, there are multiple ways that you can do that. Um, one is a gradient driven pump, in which case you are using, um, it is able to transport two different molecules or two different solutes, one that it go, that goes in with the gradient, you know, or, um, just the way you would expect to from higher concentration to lower concentration, while the second one is going to move against the concentration gradient. In this case, the energy to move, the uh, move against the concentration gradient is provided by the help of the solute that is going in with the concentration gradient. So this is a gradient-driven pump. A second way is by ATP-driven pump in which case the ATP is going to be used to phosphorylate the transporter, which allows for its conformational change 
to allow the molecule or solute to get out against the concentration gradient. And the third one is light driven pump. This is usually seen in bacteria, in the case of bacteria or toxin, um, where light energy is used to change the conformation of that protein to allow for the movement of the solute outside the cell um, against the concentration gradient. Now, here is an example of a particular pump that uses ATP, right? This is a sodium pump that is going to use the ATP energy to do that. However, it also actually acts, it's a two, you know, in the, there are two types of pumps that you can see there. Uh, they are usually also gradient driven pumps that can be associated with ATP pump as well. So in this case, not only is it using ADP to drive the energy, uh, to take the energy to drive potassium uh, against the concentration gradient, but it is also a gradient driven pump in the sense that it uses that to then bring potassium into the cell uh, with the concentration gradient. So here it is going to take, again, um, it's an, going to be a combination of the electrochemical gradient with potassium to control how much calcium is, uh, how much potassium is going in or out of the cell, while for the sodium, it is going to be going against the concentration gradient, again, with the electrochemical gradient. So for the potassium, for the sodium uh, pump, it uses ATP to phosphorylate itself, which changes the conformation to an open form. So sodium ions can go out and it uses that to pump sodiums out of the cell um, also, it can either pump potassium out of the cell or bring it in, depending on what it needs to do. Now, let's look at the way it works more in detail. So, usually, it starts off by taking a sodium ion in uh, from the cytosolic space. The pump then hydroly uh, hydrolyzes an ATP molecule to phosphorylate itself. This provides the energy to open the uh, conformation to the outside where sodium can then be ejected into the extracellular space. In that open form, while it is phosphorylated, it will bind a potassium ion that can then be released into the cell after it dephosphorylates itself, right? So that is the process with which that occurs. So it is using the ATP energy both to you know, expel the uh, sodium ion out and bring that potassium in, in one cycle. The sodium pump generates a very strong concentration gradient of sodium ions across the plasma membrane to keep it the way it is uh, to maintain the cytosolic con ionic concentration. The gradient pump, um, on the other hand, when they are just a simple gradient pump, they exploit solute gradients, uh, two different solute gradients to mediate active transport. Uh, so they have a coupled transport where one um, ion is going with the concentration gradient while the second one is going against the concentration gradient. And both of them are going to be coming in at the same time, right? Uh, so this is an example of what we call a symport a couple transport where both are transport, co-transported together. In an antiport transport, one of the molecule is going to come in uh, with the concentration gradient while the anti-transported ion is gonna be taken out against the concentration gradient. And this would be an antiport. So these are two different ways that couple transport can happen in gradient driven pumps. In both cases, the main thing to remember is that one of the ions has to be with the concentration gradient while the other one is going to be against the concentration gradient. And it can use, uh, they can be co-transported in a symport and um, one is transported out and the other is transported in in the antiport condition. A third way that uh, you can have transportation of these ions is through a uniport where that transported molecule is then getting brought back into the uh, lipid membrane through a transporter as well. Now, um, this is used in the case of 
uh, our gut lumen, right, in our guts to move the sugar molecules, to move the glucose molecules into and out of the gut space. Um, they use a uh, the sodium gradient to drive the transport of glucose, even when it is against the transportation gradient. It's not always going to be from highest concentration to the lowest concentration. So in your extracellular space, you will have obviously the higher uh, sodium ion concentration. And in the cytosolic space, you will have a lower sodium concentration. In this uh, particular pump, you are going to use the binding of your sodium ion um, as a co-transport mechanism to also transport the sodium, uh, the glucose molecule with it. When they both are bound together, they are going to open inwards into the cell space to move both sodium as well as glucose molecules inside the cell. So if you are um, either short in glucose or short in sodium, this transport cannot happen. You need both in order for it to work properly or work efficiently, right? So if you don't have enough uh, sodium ions, then you won't be able to transport glucose and vice versa. So here is an example of how this is important in our everyday life, just to move sugar molecules into um, our gut lumen and then provide it as energy to our actual cells. So here you have your extracellular fluid um, and then you have your cells. This is the basal side and this is your gut lumen. You are going to have your glucose molecules and the sodium ions in that gut lumen. They need to be taken in using this transporter into the cell, but now they we don't want to keep them there, right? So there needs to be a different type of pump to release the glucose into the extracellular fluid so it can go into the bloodstream and get to other cells. So the this is two different things. Again, you can see the presence of tight junctions in there. On one side of, on the apical side of your cell, you're going to have these dual transporters where sodium and glucose can be picked up from the gut lumen into the cell. And then on the basal side of your cell, the same cell is gonna have a very different cell membrane composition where you have specific glucose transporter, right? The uniport that will only take glucose and send it out into the extracellular space. At the same time, you may also have the sodium potassium pumps here to control the concentration of sodium and potassium ions and maintain the cytosolic ionic pressure in the same space. So glucose is gonna be released passively to, use, to be used by other cells, regardless of what the concentration of glucose is in this cell or in the outside. Um, and here, it's gonna be picked up from it even if there was glucose already spread out this is the way that it takes it in using the power of the, uh, you know, the sodium ions, even when so-called there was no uh, need for additional glucose to be brought in because they need to then release it to the outside for the rest of the body cells to be taking it. So you will have low glucose concentration towards the apical side. You will have a high glucose concentration within the cell and even though there's a high glucose concentration within the cell, it's still going to keep bringing it in because it is then releasing it out into the extracellular fluid for the use of the rest of the body. Uh, is that process clear? Uh, yes, but why like the glucose concentration is high uh, in, inside the cell always? It is always going to be in, you know, high inside the cell because it's constantly picking it up whether or not it needs it. Now, obviously, if you've been fasting, right? When you first wake up in the morning, it's not going to be as high. It's going to be low. But in general, um, if you think about it throughout the day, since it's going to be just picking it up constantly along with the sodium, it's using the sodium-driven glucose import. It's always going to have glucose inside whether or not it's present somewhere else but then it's going to be releasing it out into the extracellular fluid um, at a certain rate. It's not gonna be, that rate is controlled, right? Because that's a passive transport. So it's gonna be releasing it out into the extracellular fluid, into your bloodstream as needed for the work. So it kind of builds up inside the cell membrane in general, the intestinal epithelium. They will always have a little bit higher concentration of 
Okay. So the um, uh, the transport of glucose into the extracellular fluid slows down from the concentration that's in the um, in the blood or in the Yes. But um, so does that it still, is controlled? Say. Uh, does it still stay? Does it stay higher than the sodium then, or do they kind of even out for sand? Well, it's going to maintain it. Uh, you know, uh, typical pressure. So it's not gonna, it, I don't, uh, you know, it, I don't think it's so dependent on sodium ions as it is on glucose concentration within the bloodstream. Okay. So it's never gonna be, it's unless you have an electrolyte imbalance, which is then, you know, an issue, it's never gonna get above uh, or below the sodium ion concentration. Okay. Thank you. So glucose you know, release into the bloodstream is controlled by our general metabolic rate and the way of whatever our own bodies, it's going to be different for different people, right? Within that normal range, but it's going to be slightly different rate for different in different uh, individuals or in different organisms even. But that whatever their basal concentration is that they are maintaining is what it's going to dictate how quickly that glucose is released by these uh, intestinal epithelium cells. Okay. Okay, and we'll actually talk a little bit more about that a little later, but when we do the um, metabolism and metabolic pathways, we will be talking more about what types of things will control it. Um, and the, we are talking about right now, like the most basic level, what it is that is moving these trans, you know, allowing this transport to happen. But there are a lot of other things that are controlling it, right? The presence of hormones in our body, this presence of specific types of sugars in our body that are going to control the way they are metabolized and released as well. And other uh, nutrients that are present there too that also need to be moving it. Okay, so the next one that we are going to be looking at is a calcium pump that maintains the cytosolic calcium ion concentration. Now, typically speaking, um, this is especially important in our muscle cells because uh, for proper contractile function. Um, and so in those, uh, you know, and this is again, it is showing your sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it is looking at um, one of those muscle fibers you want to keep the concentration of calcium at a very low level. There's a specific threshold at which it needs to be maintained in order to not cause tremors or in order to not cause inappropriate muscle contraction movements. And that is maintained through these calcium pumps um, that are going to be more saturated in the muscle fibers, right? In those cells associated with the muscle fibers where the, this is again uh, moving using an ATP driven pump. Uh, the, uh, however, in this case, there's typically an aspartic acid molecule that is uh, keeping the pump closed. Uh, but when the calcium ions bind to this transporter in the binding site, um, ATP is used, utilized to release that to the outside, to the lumen of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to maintain um, low calcium concentration within the cytosolic space. And it leads to phosphorylation of the aspartic acid, um, which is what is opening the pump to the outside uh, luminal space. Now, this uh, is again, an example of how these actual ATP driven pumps are the various types of transporters are extremely important in maintaining the electrochemical gradients throughout our cells, whether it's an animal cell or a plant cell. Uh, so if you were to look in our animal cells, you have sodium pumps that just are looking at sodium potassium concentrations. These are ATP driven pumps. You also have sodium pump um, driven symports like the ones we just talked about with the glucose sodium uh, dual uh, transport system. And then within our lysosomes, you have these hydrogen proton pumps that also um, will be using ATP to drive hydrogen ions into the lysosome against the concentration gradient. In, uh, in plant cells, you will actually see hydrogen pumps both within the vacuum inside internally, uh, but also in their membranes um, as well. 
where they drive uh, the amount of hydrogen ions that are taken in versus out to maintain balance of the cell uh, ionic concentrations. And these pumps you have similar to sodium ions in animal cells. They kind of function the same way in plant cells, but here you have um, ATP driven ionic pumps to um, drive protons outside or simports that can then combine with other agents to bring uh, solutes into the cell. Okay, uh, so the next thing we'll talk about is ionic channels themselves. So these are like your sodium potassium ions. These are extremely selective, right? So they usually can only bring in the type of ions that, are, um, that they are meant for. So in this case, we are showing you a selective uh, you know, filter uh, that exists within that channel that allows for only a particular type of ion to go through inside or outside the cell. So typically inside, this is an aqueous pore. So it does allow water molecules to be moving through it as well in this particular channel. You have a potassium ion. It's usually going to have a lot of water molecules around it because it's ionic and this is a water channel. As it moves through the channel, there will be a selectivity filter area where those molecules will be, uh, the water molecules will um, be dispersed and only if it fits in that space is it gonna be allowed to move out um, of that particular pore to the other side. Ion channels, because of that, are what we can uh, call gated channels. So they um, close when there is nothing bound to it. And when they are open, that is when the selectivity filter is uh, open as well. They kind of go randomly between open and closed states. And you will, uh, there is a, you know, um, structure for that channel uh, link over here that you can look at to uh, look at how we know the structure and the selectivity filters existence in there. Um, they kind of snap open and close states kind of randomly. However, overall, um, it is going to be dependent on the environmental needs, the cells needs based on the environmental stimuli to control how much sodium or potassium ion is going in or out. The selectivity filter will only work when it is in the open state. Uh, so for these um, filters, for these particular channels, they are, as we talked about, they need to balance at the end of the day, the overall ion concentration inside versus outside of the cell. Uh, and if you were to look at your cell membrane, you are going to see um, in a typical cell where there's no membrane potential involved, you will see there will be equal amount of ionic concentration, both on the inside and the outside of the cell. There won't be that membrane potential where one side is positively charged versus the other is more negatively charged. However, when you're looking at muscle cells or nerve cells that are transmitting signals that are performing work, you will notice that they will have a very clear um, gradient or a membrane potential where one side is going to have a more net positive charge uh, than the second side that will have a more negative uh, charge. And that will control the number of sodium ions that are coming in or potassium ions that are going out, okay? Um, now, potassium ions in general can, um, leak through the channel a little bit more easily. And that allows them to make that membrane potential, to create that membrane potential and maintain it when it is needed. Um, when that channel is closed, then you will not have the leakiness, obviously, right? And so that is how you maintain um, the membrane potential at zero in a typical setting. However, whenever that channel is open, it will tend to drive the potassium out um, due to the concentration gradient. Since that is the one that is going with the concentration gradient, it will tend to just throw them out and that will drive your voltage gradient so that you end up with that membrane potential. So that's how our cells may create the membrane potential is by keeping, uh, by um, the open channels that allow for the leakiness of these potassium ions. Now we can monitor the open and closed channels 
through an experiment called patch clamp, where we take an electrode or, you know, it's usually a very tiny microelectrode glass tube that we attach to the cell membrane and we can record how um, the channels are opening and closing in that space um, in a very kind of uh, accurate manner. We can do that in the presence of various ions or in just a typical environment. And that recording will show any time that the channel is open, it will show this excitation uh, peak that shows that you are seeing movement of ions into or out of the cell. Um, and when there is no open channel, you will just see a flat line, okay? Any questions up till here before we talk about gated ion channels a little bit more? Um, does detaching the channel of interest for patch clamp recording mm -hmm. affect the pattern of opening and closing for the gated channel? Well, it doesn't affect it. It is used to record it. So that's how we uh, record how many times a channel is opening during a given time and for how long it is opening for. And if that is like opening in a consistent, you know, pattern or not. For example, this one seems to be opening every, you know, five milliseconds, for example, right? It stays, oh, it stayed open a little longer in this stage and was very consistent the other one. So we use it to record any, uh, for a cell, we use it to record if it is creating those membrane potentials and how many times it is opening or closing these channels or how many channels even it has that are opening and closing within a given period of time. Okay? Okay, thank you. No well. Okay. How are we on time? Oh, we are way off, but that's okay. Let's see, where do, oh yeah, we're almost in that space. So we'll get to 28 and then the neuron portion I will uh, record and post uh, after I post this particular part. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is different types of gated ion channels that we have in our body to respond to various types of stimuli. And these are some of the things that you would have read about also in um, the article that I gave you for this week. So there are three main types of um, gated ion channels. You have uh, voltage-gated ion channels that are going to respond to ionic changes, the membrane potential, when it is existing, um, to use that in order to figure out when it's going to open or close. You have ligand-gated channels, which respond when there is a molecule bound to the actual channel itself that um, allows it to become open or flipped, um, uh, change conformation so that the channel can be opened. And then you have mechanically gated ion channels, which open and close in response to some type of actual mechanical force. Uh, so these are, you know, and that could be touch, that could be some other thing, that could be pressure, touch, something like that. So the, these are the three main types of gated ion channels that you want to be aware of. So we use mechanically gated ion channels that uh, in our air canal in order for us to care. So our auditory cells will have these channels on their epical end that are going to allow, that will open when uh, sound waves are hitting them. And that is what is going to allow for us to care um, as they move in response to it, that's what's going to allow us to hear. And we can see that in this 3D you know, image of the scanning electron micrography, right? You can see these hair uh, like cilias that are uh, moving, that will move when um, the sound waves are hitting it. So here in the closed channel, they are linked together. They are not tilted. They're going to be completely in their neutral uh, manner. When the channel opens, they tilt um, in the movement uh, in response to the sound waves that are hitting them. Another uh, type of mechanically gated channels um, that work in combination with voltage gated channels are in those touch sensitive glands, in the leaves of those glands. In this case, the mechanically gated channels are going to open in response to the touch um, that they feel and that in turn opens voltage gated ion channels that 
uh, move influx of ions into the cells to cause them to close up in that way. Okay, so that is where I'm gonna stop. And then I'm gonna talk about how neurons in our brain um, move information uh, in the form of action potentials using these type of ionic channels. And uh, that is a very important function um, that is present for the ionic channels. And so we will talk about that uh, in the last section. Okay, any questions? Yes, we end at 12.05, which is now. Um, so how do steroids uh, considered small and diffuse fluorescent, even though they are non-polar, they form fused rings and sometimes lengthy branches? So it's not, uh, Ryan, is Ryan still here? I don't know. Yes, he's here. Right here. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I just saw that question in the chat. Uh, not all steroids will go through, but some of them are small enough um, and uh, not so bulky that they can move through. And since they are integral part of uh, a very fluid membrane anyway, so even bulky steroids can be part of the actual plasma membranes, they do have the ability to at least get integrated into the membrane, if not go all the way through. But it's not every single steroid that's going to go through, but uh, some of them that are still in that um, size range that can move through. Okay, fake plants never die. Yes, they don't, but they don't look as well. Any other questions? Hi. Okay, guys, no problem. Take care. Thank you, and you have a good day. You too, take care. <laughs>